So good afternoon here in Spain and good morning, Michael. This is a, a new colloquia, the colloquia series, a new colloquium from the Instituto de Astrofisica de Andalusia in Granada. And today we will have the talk by Dr. Michael Rich from UCLA in Arizona. He will talk about the Blanco Decan Bulge Survey. And uh, Isabel Marquez will make the proper introduction uh, for Michael. So hello, everybody. Good morning, afternoon, or evening, depending on when, where, where you are uh, now. And uh, thank you very much, all of you, for attending the very second uh, web locum in, in 2021. Last one was, uh, the first one was just two days ago. Uh, so I think it's maybe still soon enough to wish you uh, a happy new year. This, uh, uh, new, uh, we, we all hope to be new, really new. Uh, I thank you, our speaker today. Uh, for accepting our invitation to uh, contribute to the online colloquia in our Severo Chua program at the IAM. Um, of course. Uh, so our invited speaker is Professor Michael Rich, uh, who is full research astronomer and adjunct full professor at University of California, Los Angeles in the United States. He obtained his PhD um, at the California Institute of Technology in 1986, advised by Jeremy Mould. He then got a Carnegie Fellowship at the Department of Terrestrial Magnetism and then an Alfred Sloan Fellow. He was uh, assistant professor and then senior research scientist at the Columbia University and then research astronomer finally in where, where he's now at the University of California, Los Angeles. Uh, among significant doctoral students, uh, it's, um, there are some, some of them uh, with remarkable careers, including Hong Shen Zhao, professor at St. Andrews University and uh, developer of the first uh, self-consistent bot model for the bulge. There's also Neil deGrasse Tyson, uh, the very well-known educator and popularizer of astronomy, and Edgar Smith, uh, Chair Emeritus of Pri Pri Princeton's Astrophysics Department Visiting Committee and PI of the Calypso LSST Monitor Telescope. Significant postdoctoral scientists include Ivo Savian, site director of La Silla Observatory, Andreas Koch, Emily Nether, uh, group leader in Heidelberg, and Christian Jensen, a clay fellow at the um, Harvard Smithsonian CFA. Uh, Mike Rich uh, works on the subject of galactic archaeology, making use of data mainly coming from the CAC and the HST to get the ages, chemistry, kinematics, and structure of star populations at the present epoch. These fossil, uh, fossil records are a constrained and primary source of information on theories of galaxy formation and evolution that are complement complementary to the inferences drawn by the study of the distant universe. He's a member of a number of research teams for related projects like Cosmos, LSST, CAC, Cosmic Web Imager, or GALAX, and is principal investigator of the project uh, Bulge Radio Velocity SA and Blanco de Cam Bulge Survey. In fact, this, uh, today his talk uh, is devoted to the, this last survey and is entitled the Blanco de Cam Bulge Survey, a panchromatic window on the galactic bulge. So uh, thank you very much, uh, Mike, for accepting the invitation. Uh, I say it again, uh, and I extend this invitation to a real one in the future when possible or uh, viable for you, wherever. So thank you very much and welcome. Thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. I'm really honored. In fact, uh, uh, the, the organizers asked for a brief bio and you found much more. So thank you. Mm. I really appreciate it. It's an honor to speak to you uh, even remotely. But the miracles of Zoom and remote communication make a lot of things possible. Um, and uh, that's wonderful. I'm, I can be here in Los Angeles and you can hear the talk in Spain. Great. Um, I also want to mention uh, some of the uh, important collaborators, uh, Christian Johnson, uh, Space Tele who's now at Space Telescope, who's the co-principal investigator of this project, uh, Yulia Simeon, uh, at uh, who is uh, at the Shanghai Astronomical Observatory, uh, and uh, Scott Michael, Mike Young at Indiana. Uh, all of the people listed here, uh, uh, particularly Thomas uh, Tommaso Marchetti, who is collaborating with our uh, integration of the data set uh, with Gaia. Uh, these are all very significant collaborators, and I'm very grateful 
the project wouldn't exist without them. <clears throat> also, I just wanted to call out a couple of things. First of all, um, the wonderful honor for your institute of um, the Nobel Prize in Physics of 2020, which was enabled really by the discovery by Reiner Shuttle of the S02 star uh, that has a 15 year orbit around the supermassive black hole at the center of the Milky Way. It was the encounter of this star with the black hole, uh, in particular as observed both uh, at Keck and with the gravity instrument at ESO um, that generated the data set for which um, the Nobel Prize uh, recognized. But without the discovery of this star, um, it's hard to say that uh, a prize beyond um, uh, the, uh, uh, the Crawford Prize would have been awarded. But the spectacular observation of the gravitational redshift and relativistic effects uh, that were for the first time very clearly revealed uh, uh, generated this Nobel Prize. It's a pity that the Nobel Prize is limited to a small number of people because Reiner certainly would have been uh, perhaps a co-awardee uh, if we had a more a democratic method of awarding the prize. Of course, democratic methods are a big issue <laughs> in all countries these days, particularly my own. Um, I, I do need want to also... weigh in here, I'm sorry. <laughs> like, this is sorry? too much. I need to <laughs> weigh in here, I'm sorry, but uh, I really have to say that there's other people who would go before me, like Andreas Eckert and so, and, and, and oh, it was sure. democratically decided who would be the first author on this paper. So, so, so that, that the first authorship on that paper that was uh, awarded to me, uh, but it was not entire. I mean, I did, I did my work there and I did my contribution, but, but. I, I love your modesty and it no, should, no, 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 don't, but don't, don't, a, uh, it should be a, a model for everybody. Of, of course, without, also without me, it would have been exactly the same. Yeah, <laughs> well, I, I admire your modesty, and, and it's something we should all aspire to, particularly after the events of last week, but it's a wonderful thing in our profession uh, to be modest and generous. Uh, so the other person I have to call out at your institute is Javier Roman, who, with whom I'm collaborating on a very high risk, but perhaps high excitement, small telescope project to study low surface brightness galaxies. And Javier has been a tremendous collaborator uh, I don't have any data from that project um, that I could show, but um, he has really revolutionized the use of our telescope and we're doing a number of things with narrow band imaging uh, that look very exciting. Um, and certainly small telescopes have their place as well. So thank you, Javi. Okay, so um, why are we interested in the galactic bulge? Well, uh, the nearest such similar population is in M31. It's 100 times more distant than the bulge. Um, 100 times more distant. Also, the bulge is as close as we can touch to the galaxy, to the stellar populations in uh, giant elliptical galaxies and bulges and galaxies like this one, M31, um, that you know, are, have a completely different history of formation and chemical evolution than our local disk. Um, so studying these uh, populations in detail are, is, is the goal of this project. Um, so I'm gonna uh, give you a little overview here. Uh, there's the, I'm gonna talk about uh, central bulges and bars briefly, what kind of bulge we have in the Milky Way, um, uh, formation scenarios, uh, briefly, uh, and the controversy over the, the controversies that led us to undertake this survey. And then I'll talk about the survey itself and present some results. Um, so there are two kinds of bulges. There are those that have bars. On the left, you could see these long uh, spindle shaped structures. Um, these tend to have old metal rich populations. And then there are these so-called classical bulges whose bulges look a little more like a small elliptical galaxy. And nearby examples include M31 and M81. This is a map of our galaxy, a kind of a schematic uh, artist conception. Our position would be here and one end of the bar somewhat points in our direction. 
Um, so this again, this is classical, kind of more like a little elliptical galaxy in the center and the boxy or X-shaped. And when we see a kind of a structure like this X on the right, I don't think you could see my cursor, but I should at least point out that on the right, NGC 4710 uh, has a, an X-shaped structure. Our galaxy has that too. That's a, a symptom of one of these bar structures in the center. So what we have in our galaxy might not be typical of the more massive bulges, but it's the best that we can do. Um, there's a, been a long debate over how the bulge might have formed. Um, there, you know, were there initially some clumps that had separate chemical evolution. Um, I think that there is growing evidence that, that, that if there were clumps, the chemical evolution was so similar, they cannot be distinguished via their chemistry. Um, th there is also the question of how early the bulge formed. I think there are many questions that are up for grabs still. Um, the, the bulge does not appear to have formed early and really, really fast. And yet it does consist of stars that seem to be for the most part quite old, but it does not seem to have had the violent early formation history of elliptical galaxies. Perhaps the most uh, promising idea for how the bulge has formed is a massive bar that buckles over time, uh, that vertically thickens as, as shown in this picture and I'll also show in a simulation later. So you start with a massive disk and that disk develops an instability uh, and that instability vertically buckles and becomes the bar. Um, so that at the origin of the bulge's formation is a massive disk. Um, just to put the galactic bulge in context, when we look up at the Milky Way, we don't see the prominent picture with our eyes that we see from two mass. And that's because of all the extinction. But if you're in the Southern hemisphere, you can see get a, a sense visually of where the center of the galaxy lies. Um, you really see the brighter portion of the Milky Way towards Sagittarius. Also superimposed, but not in the same location, is the Sagittarius dwarf spheroidal galaxy discovered by Rod Ibotta. So it's, it's in this area, but it does multiple loops around the Milky Way. Um, so this slide is intentionally kind of messed up. <laughs> it, the bulge is hard to study. It's relatively distant and there's a lot of dust and extinction. There's also tremendous stellar crowding, multiple stellar populations. And that's why it was the last of the major stellar populations to receive attention in detail. Now, the European community is undertaking many significant surveys of the bulge. There will be the foremost optical spectrograph survey at both low and high resolution. And the moon's uh, spectroscopic instrument is being used to undertake uh, um, enormous surveys that will be run out of ESO. Um, now, um, the question of age, I'm now gonna to turn to age. Perhaps the most significant studies of age use the Hubble Space Telescope to do proper motion separation because you could see um, there the disk uh, superimposes the bulge, but the disk population fortunately has principally disk kinematics. So it's possible to veto these stars. And when you do this, you find a blue straggler population that's intrinsic. And you also see uh, an old main sequence turnoff population that is roughly the age of the oldest globular star clusters. Um, so you, when you undertake this, and this was originally done by uh, Kuiken and Rich 2002, that you could see this uh, very nice old population. Um, but in recent years, there has been a controversy. And that is that um, microlens bulge stars have been studied at high spectral resolution with a self-consistent 
analysis of stellar gravity and abundances. And it has been inferred that these must be massive young stars. And the age is, is strikingly, you know, the, the inferences are striking in, in concern. Um, we see younger stars that seem to be metal rich and span a wide range of ages um, and seem to be consistent with the overall bulge abundance chemical evolution scenarios. This is work by Bensby et al. 2017 and uh, 2013. Um, a large fraction of stars younger than eight giga years, but they don't show up in the color magnitude diagram. This has set up a tension that, you know, they're, when you look at these micro lens bulge dwarfs, they're briefly uh, amplified when a small, uh, a low mass star passes in front of the distant star, they're amplified and shockingly, um, you, you derive that these are quite massive and young, so young that they should easily be visible uh, in the color magnitude diagram, and they're not. Um, Alvio Renzini has led a uh, HST proper motion, uh, HST uh, treasury survey of the bulge, and using the uh, method he pioneered of comparing luminosity functions puts very severe limits at the main sequence turnoff on the fraction of young stars. So there's a real tension here concerning age. Um, by the way, um, done, work done at your institute led by Reiner Schertl's group also finds um, uh, a, a confirmation that in the very nuclear region of the galaxy, the population is old and metal rich. And here you can see the uh, peak uh, in the luminosity function from the red clump helium burning stars that is used to constrain the age of this population. And this will be something that as we move to a higher resolution, uh, a higher spatial resolution telescopes in the next generation era that we will reach the main sequence turnoff and potentially get more information um, I'll briefly, very briefly, talk about the composition of stars. No life. Um, the um, the uh, um, stars that uh, the origin of chemical elements are such that massive stars, um, core collapse supernovae produce light alpha elements, as we know, the core deflagration stars produce uh, iron. Uh, so there's the this famous trend here. Um, this is from Matteucci and Broccato, that systems that form quickly tend to have elevated alpha to iron uh, at high metallicity. This has been confirmed in the galactic bulge. Um, the galactic bulge has one of the strongest enhancements of alpha elements of any stellar population at high metallicity. Um, this for all of these different elements, and here you could see the line at solar metallicity, and the alpha elements are all enhanced. And in fact, the bulge seems to, uh, and this continues to be the case, um, have a single alpha to iron trend. There's a handful of stars at low alphas, um, but it seems like over the entire bulge from the very center to uh, about one kiloparsec distance, we can see uh, evidence of this single trend in alpha to iron. In addition, the bulge and thick disk are quite similar. Uh, so again, this emphasizes the connection between the bulge and the disk. And finally, um, the lanthanum to europium is consistent with very rapid formation of the bulge. The summary, the, the reason I'm showing all these plots is that there is evidence from the chemical abundances that the bulge form early and rapidly. Now let's talk about the problems that led to this survey. One is an intriguing finding by Manuela Zaccoli in her paper that stars with less than solar metallicity have a spheroidal distribution, a spatial distribution, where stars above the solar metallicity have a flattened uh, disky distribution, a striking transition around solar metallicity. This plot here shows the so-called vertex deviation versus iron to hydrogen. 
This uh, kind of plot is going to be improved upon dramatically. There's already a paper by Simeon et al. And that will improve further as time goes on. We're going to see um, a, uh, um, uh, you know, this, this is basically the barredness of the bulge as a function of metallicity. And there seems to be a transition, not at solar metallicity, but about minus 0.5, where the bulge appears to become more uniform and its kinematics such as consistent with a bar. Another problem, uh, and I, there just isn't time to get into this. There have been a lot of surveys of the bulge using automated abundance determination methods. Um, there, I think that while Apogee and many other surveys report a large number of, of abundance determinations, it's not clear that all of these are really correct although they seem to overall confirm the high alphas and the generally uniform trends in metallicity. But there have been a lot of problems with these analyses. Um, you know, you're trying to get hundreds of thousands of spectra and do a kind of a pseudo high resolution abundance analysis and you pay a price. Another problem, and this is a table from uh, Barbwee's review, uh, annual review, um, is that many different investigations find different abundance distributions for the bulge. This complicated table shows that virtually every study of the abundance distribution of the bulge is in disagreement about the number of peaks of the distribution and the width of the distribution. And this is a problem because the abundance distribution is an important constraint in the formation history. And perhaps one of the most extreme of these is from Bensby's 2017 work based on the high resolution spectroscopy of the um, microlens dwarfs. And here you can see these five or six peaks in the abundance distribution. How could that happen? How would you have so many separate events of star formation uh, in um, attributed to the formation of the bulge? Another feature which is not a problem, but a observation that is now confirmed by many studies, including the Argo study, is that the bulge rotates on cylindrical rotation. This is the rotation curve as a function of galactic latitude. Uh, and that is due to the, um, uh, the bar, uh, pattern speed of the bar. So one doesn't see a change in rotation speed as a function of galactic latitude. Shen et al produced this beautiful model here. This is a simple n-body model. And what you see here is a massive disk that develops an m equals one instability. And this vertically thickens to produce a bulge structure that we see today. And this uh, animation, which I hope you can see okay, will repeat now. Um, but we attribute the formation of the bulge um, to this uh, buckling of the bar. So addressing all of these problems and also being well aware that the BBB survey has had a 10 year lead start on us, we decide instead to do, to use the Blanco, uh, the, the dark energy camera, and we undertook the Blanco DCAM bulge survey. This is really compared to other large surveys, just a handful of nights on the telescope. We were assigned about 20 nights, half of them were not useful. Um, it has proven difficult to get any additional observing time, but we were able to cover 200 square degrees of the bulge, um, which covers an area of 26 globular, including 26 globular clusters. It's a contiguous area. Uh, there have been other studies that of Saha in 2019 that, um, was a large time series studies aimed at uh, studying the ROI reefs uh, in the galactic bulge, but this is a wide field study. So this is the Blanco four meter telescope in Chile. We named the survey after Victor and Betty Blanco, uh, who were responsible for, uh, Victor Blanco was the first director, was responsible for the commissioning of the four meter telescope. But he also really saved the uh, Cerro Tololo Observatory politically because during the early years, Augusto Pinochet became president of Chile and was on a hunt 
for uh, potential leftists that he thought were everywhere, including at the observatory. So there's a funny story that under the left-leading government, um, the Chilean government, uh, local government believed for sure that Cerro Tololo was a secret United States missile site. He had a big party at the observatory, invited the governor over and made sure that every observatory dome was opened and inspected, every possible dome space on the observatory to make sure that there were telescopes and not missiles. At the same time, um, later on, when there were uh, purges and hunts for uh, employees, depending on their political leanings, uh, he deftly made sure that the political affiliations of every person working at Cerro Tololo were never discovered. Uh, that was a scary time in Chile. And the great fear that justified Pinochet's uh, uprising was that a quote unquote socialist government would take over. Does that uh, perhaps sound familiar? Anyway, enough politics. Politics has been dominating things too much. The Dark Energy Camera Project was funded by the Department of Energy. I've actually, when I give public talks, I've actually had uh, people in the audience ask me, how do you image dark energy? Well, the point of this, of course, was to do a very large supernova um, survey to uh, understand the equation of state of the dark energy. Um, and there's been a number of, it's, it's been run uh, more or less like a physics project, but what you see here is 62, 2048 by 4096 CCDs in the focal plane. And it is the largest camera on a, a largest field of view on a large telescope and will continue to be that way until the Rubin Observatory uh, gets its first light. So we've had two papers published so far uh, in the monthly notices. I'll talk about results from those papers and uh, uh, some uh, uh, forward-looking work that is just being undertaken now. And here are the two papers, and I recommend that you uh, enjoy them and have a look at them. We also had a nice press release through NOAO and also a call out uh, from Phil Plate's uh, Bad Astronomy, which is uh, kind of a nice thing. Um, and uh, he's kind of a blogger, but uh, the fact that we made the uh, radar screen is nice. Here's a view of Bada's window imaged with uh, one of these large detectors. Uh, two CCDs have ultimately been lost from the array, but still it's a very powerful instrument. It also gives you an idea of the data reduction challenge. The, here you see all of these separate detectors. Uh, if you wanna have a calibrated um, set of observations, um, you have to obtain things in photometric conditions or have overlap so that all the fields can be calibrated to the photometric zero points. So this is an enormous amount of data reduction. This shows uh, Bada's window uh, in a multicolor image. Uh, this is NGC 6528 and 6522. By the way, why is Bada's window Bada's window? Well, it isn't the only transparent place in the bulge. It's one of lower reddening, uh, but also it, at the time that Bada developed interest in it, he noted that the globular cluster NGC 6522 would allow some kind of standard reddening curve to be measured. It was an object of known metallicity and characteristics uh, and that would allow the stellar population of the bulge to be studied in detail. A whole history of the modern investigation of the bulge is an interesting talk, but not what I'll do today. This shows a zoom in of our um, field. And this, this shows the fields that we ultimately ended up imaging. So this is the um, Southern Galactic Bulge, which has the lowest foreground extinction and is most often studied. This has a large fraction, roughly 50% of the bulge's stellar mass. These two fields are centered on the Sagittarius Dwarf Spheroidal Galaxy. And these two, these fields unreduced, in fact, all of these are unreduced. The blue circles indicate disk comparison fields that we hope to reduce and uh, uh, subtract as we, uh, from the data as we work on the age constraints for the bulge. Um, if you're interested in globular clusters, the data set is impressive. And at the moment, while we have not done a public release of data, we are open to providing data to requests from people interested in collaborating. Um, 
since the analysis of the project is not funded at this point, we have elected to delay the release, uh, public release of data, but you can see that there is a trove of globular clusters that span a wide range in abundance um, from as low as minus 1.5 dex to uh, solar metallicity. So it's a very, very uh, powerful data set for the study of globular clusters. Um, and um, this shows also our field superimposed on uh, the two micron map uh, produced by Launhart et al. Again, this shows you know, what a large fraction of the bulge we actually obtain. Um, and we employ the VVV survey, which um, was used by Simeon et al. to do a one by one arc minute reddening map. And that's what the, these, these interlocking white circles on the left show our fields. And the reddening map was created by Simeon using the red clump. Um, the data reduction was done by Christian Johnson at Space Telescope Science Institute. He's the co-principal investigator. This was 50 terabytes of data. You saw that one frame, but in order to um, succeed, we needed both short and long exposures. And remember, we have six photometric man passes. Um, the entire data set had to be calibrated and reduced with DAO photo and done using a super uh, computer facility. But the management of the data reduction was a very much single person intensive effort that took Christian Johnson well over 50%, uh, about six months of a year. And this shows the flow chart. You start with the data coming in the archive and being stored at the Pervasive Technology Institute at Indiana University. And then you have both calibration images and science instruments. And these all have to be separated out by filter, exposure time, block, night observed. Um, was, the, um, was the observation taken in photometric conditions? Um, in order, you also had to do what's called a growth curve um, you have to do an aperture correction for each frame because the seeing changes. And if you want to get a uniform photometric zero point across this entire field, you need to have aperture corrections derived for these thousands of frames. Um, then you have to have image level catalogs. Um, you have to do the um, point spread function fitting. Uh, and finally, merge the catalog. Uh, this was a this was an extraordinary effort producing 500 million stars with six photometric measurements each spanning the full range of uh, stellar magnitude observable toward the bulge. These complex diagrams here indicate how the um, each DE cam field was cross calibrated and relying on other photometric fields to set the final photometric zero point. Some fields were observed under non-photometric conditions with severe cirrus, uh, and the zero point had to be transferred to the entire data set. And this shows this is not a, an image of the bulge. Rather, this is a map of points uh, source detections um, from the final data set. This shows are extinction maps, and you could see that the extinction is much more severe in the U band, uh, with as high as uh, three magnitudes of extinction, um, uh, much lower in the I band, but still very significant below minus six degrees. Um, and finally, this is um, a map, and this will be important here because we're going to be deriving metallicities from the U minus I color. Um, we also have, uh, we now show how we're uh, uh, better than many other surveys. You may be aware of the PANSTARS survey. Um, PANSTARS photometry is useful, but I'd like to uh, draw your attention to this red sequence, which is NGC 6522, a metal pore globular cluster in Bada's window at 500 parsecs from the galactic center. The DE CAP survey 
loses all of the bright end of this cluster because they didn't take short exposures and calibrate bright stars. Um, it is, has a reasonably tight red giant branch. Um, the pan star survey is all over the place uh, and is unsuccessful at really producing a usable color magnitude diagram for this cluster. Um, the tightest color magnitude diagram spanning the greatest range of photometry is from our survey. Now we are in a position to make color magnitude diagrams over the entire galactic bulge field. Here you can see the foreground disk, the red clump of the galactic bulge, um, the red giant branch. This is um, observed and this is dereddened in G minus I. And here you can see the doubled red clump. Today, I'm going to talk about a cursory modeling uh, analysis of the data set. Um, we, of course, are looking to try to model the structure of the red clump as a function of metallicity uh, and this double red clump, which is a three dimensional structure, but that is all for the future. One thing I can mention, though, is that we are very fortunate that Gaia has been able to produce. Uh, excellent astrometry, even in the galactic bulge, even considering the high extinction. And you can see the crucial red clump, whose stars we have some idea of the distance of. Um, and the Gaia limit is currently at 18. And we're hoping that eventually Gaia will produce results faint enough that we can actually uh, use the Gaia data to veto stars that are in the foreground disk. Uh, that might even be possible at some of the higher latitude bulge fields um, with Gaia DR3. Uh, one of the first things, though, that we did with the DR2 data release was to ask the following question. Saha et al. had proposed that these stars here were actually a young a population younger than 1 billion years in the, center, in the galactic bulge, a, recent, a population of recent star formation of helium burning stars on their blue loops. I'd always maintained that what these stars really are, are red clump stars that are closer to us than the galactic bulge and are in the old disk. Well, sure enough, when we did this analysis, we find that the so-called blue loop stars at the distance of the bulge turn out to be disk stars. Um, whose distances from Gaia place them around three kiloparsecs, exactly what we thought. So there is no mysterious population of young, massive stars in the bulge. I'm now going to show you just not so much science results from globular clusters, but rather what can be done. Here in this globular cluster, you can see how much better we are than pan stars. We see the blue horizontal branch and the main sequence turnoff. But we can also separate using U minus R colors um, two uh, stellar populations, and in particular, two main sequence turnoffs, metal poor and metal rich, in this globular cluster. Here we see NGC 6626 uh, and 6637, um, a metal poor and metal rich globular cluster. These populations are extracted by a proper motion selection. And the color magnitude diagrams are really extraordinary given that this is part of a 200 square degree ground-based survey. You can clearly see the main sequence turnoff here that is fit beautifully by the isochrones and remarkably stars from fainter than 20th magnitude and as bright as 12th magnitude all obtained in the one survey. NGC 6656, again, with proper motion selection. Here we can see uh, stars that are selected within six degrees of this globular cluster. As the Gaia um, data reductions improve, so will the ability to select extra tidal stars of all of these globular clusters, which will be of great interest in understanding the lifetime of globular clusters. But here you can see here is the, what we have here is the so-called vector point diagram. And this red circle shows stars whose proper motion associates them with the globular cluster, whose orbit and space associates them with membership in the globular cluster. 
And when you select these stars, you see a very clean color magnitude diagram. Um, the main, main sequence turnoff indicating the age, the very old cluster, and the blue horizontal branch and extreme horizontal branch stars. This is like an appetizer of what we can expect to see when you know, we do further analysis of this data set. Um, there was, in this globular cluster, there was a number of claims based on spectroscopy for a double red horizontal branch. We have so many different colors here, G minus R to U minus Y, and we're able to, using the U band, which is very sensitive to metallicity, search for any indication of the doubling of the red horizontal branch based on multiple populations. And uh, that uh, was ruled out for this globular cluster. Um, on a, 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 a very mysterious object called FSR 1758 was proposed to be a dwarf galaxy. But actually, when we do the color magnitude diagram and we do the proper motion selection, we find, first of all, that this is indeed a real globular cluster. And secondly, that we just see a blue horizontal branch and a red giant branch. It's um, very highly extincted, so we can't go fainter, but it looks to be a conventional globular cluster of metal pore. What about other globular clusters? Um, the VVV survey offered something like 80 proposed newly discovered globular clusters of which Manidi 22 was actually had its own APJ letter. When we examined the survey, however, um, we looked for evidence of these clusters in multiple ways. First, was the cluster actually detected in our images? Second, could we see any distinction as a function of radius from the cluster position in a different color magnitude diagram that was distinct from the field. And third, separating out the cluster members using dia, we looked for any clumping in the vector point diagram. Using all three of these methods, we were not able to confirm any of these clusters. Now, the reason that these clusters were proposed originally was because that it, there were groups of R Lyrae stars that appeared to be at similar distance. And the argument was made, well, if you see R Lyrae stars that appear to be at very similar distance, then they might be members of an unseen stellar system like a globular cluster. And that's a very good idea. It, it, it might work elsewhere. It just has not worked in the bulge so far. Then I showed this uh, diagram and then we're asking now about this problem of the multiple peaks in metallicity. Also, Ness et al had argued that the bulge consists of multiple populations. As you get closer to the plane, the metal rich population becomes more prominent. Look at population A growing here and populations of lower metallicity will become less prominent as you move toward the plane. She argued for four distinct peaks. Um, I kind of like to joke that, you know, I don't like too many Gaussians or populations. It's like martinis, one is great, two can even be better, three are really not a good idea. Um, I've always told my students that the martini rule is something that you should apply when you start using Gaussians or multiple populations. Now it's true that nature is complicated and there can be more than one population, but it's good to start with simplicity. What we decided to do was to apply the U-band um, and um, we realized that if you look at this plot here, this shows extinction for various stellar types. And you could see that the U-band is just incredibly powerful in terms of being sensitive to lots of iron lines and stars. Um, it almost is like a way to, it offers itself as a potential way of measuring abundances using photometry. In fact, this has a long heritage going back to Egan, Linden, Bell, and Sandage, who used the U-band, the Delta U, as a measurement of metallicity of halo stars. And it's been forgotten about because U-band observations are difficult and there's considerable extinction, of course. D-reddening U minus I using the Simeon reddening map, Johnson decided to 
look at one of the best catalogs of high resolution spectroscopy, that of Zakali et al. 2017. So standing on the shoulders of giants, we used her beautiful catalog and found a wonderful correlation between Fe over H derived at high resolution and the D reddened U minus I color. And this is for red clump giants. We then confirmed this at different galactic latitudes. The same correlation for red clump giants, um, same slope, uh, same scatter, using the same um, high resolution data set obtained at ESO. Now merging everything, we were able to um, find this single correlation, Fe over H, um, BDBS versus Fe over H Gibbs. Very nice correlation, uh, roughly 0.2 dex um, comparison. Um, when we look at the entire uh, bulge sample, we're able to confirm important elements that are seen by the spectroscopy, for example, uh, bimodality uh, in some of the fields that are seen in red with the spectrum, spectra, which are a few thousand stars, and in gray in our sample, which represent millions of stars. We now have 2.7 million uh, iron abundances. Um, what you see here is the red is the Zocali et al. Fe over H abundance distribution, metallicity, and the uh, gray plots are our uh, UV derived metallicity distributions. This is now, um, we're looking at minus three. This is close to the galactic plane, 500 parsecs. This is a thousand parsecs from the plane. And you can immediately notice that there is a single distribution here close to the plane. There is a single distribution here away from the plane. And then in the middle, there seems to be both distributions represented. So this is now, we have two abundance distributions in the bulge, a metal rich and a somewhat less metal rich. Both of them are, are relatively very metal rich compared to the Milky Way halo, of course, uh, but um, very different in, in the fact that the, um, uh, the metal rich distribution looks like the simple model of chemical evolution to grade towards the metal poor end, whereas the metal poor distribution degrades toward the metal rich end. And now this shows, uh, and this is some work in preparation, as we move from minus three degrees, very close to the plane, um, moving outward, and we start to see that the metal rich fraction is uh, beginning to drop uh, here at minus six degrees latitude. Um, and finally, uh, by minus eight degrees latitude, we are completely dominated by this metal poor distribution. And the interpretation of this is a, an ongoing work. Um, but what we do see here is a, a, simple, uh, a, a simplification. At low galactic latitude, we see something that looks like the one zone model of chemical evolution. Uh, at high galactic latitude, we see something different that we are interpreting at the moment in terms of chemical evolution. And this sums up, you could see the simple model of chemical evolution. Actually, this goes back to my own work at Rich et al. 1990. Um, here you could see this, this, this is the simple model of chemical evolution distribution. And then you could see um, that it's that the stars that are members of this distribution are still present at high galactic latitude, but that something is definitely changing at low as we move away from the galactic plane. Um, a metal poor peak is emerging. It seems like things are very, very stratified as a function of galactic latitude. In fact, if we break the sample up, and this is a plot that I prefer not to be circulated, but we could see that the more metal rich populations are dramatically concentrated to the plane relative to the metal poor populations. So we really see this concentration to the plane of the most metal rich stars. So we do confirm uh, some of the elements of the Argos survey and Nessus Argos survey um, that the most metal rich stars are uh, concentrated to the galactic plane. 
and the less metal rich stars are more widely dispersed. Um, this change in metallicity, by the way, is occurring from minus one deaths, one tenth solar, to about twice the solar metallicity. So this is a dramatic change. Notice also that there is really no indication of a radial variation in metallicity. So essentially what we're seeing is a disk structure that dominates the metallicity structure of the bulge. We do not find any support for a dramatic change like Zuckley asserts uh, at solar metallicity. So here is the, you know, the, as we cross from solar metallicity, we really don't see anything except that below about minus 0.3 dex, the, um, the vertical distribution of the stars is much uh, uh, steeper. There's many more metal poor stars at high galactic latitudes compared to um, the uh, uh, metal rich stars. So there's a real uh, stratification as a function of metallicity, but we do not see this um, morphology change that Zoccoli asserts. This shows the mean metallicity of stars in our data and kind of makes the same point. Now, looking forward, um, and this is a project that is just uh, in preparation now, you can use the UVAN data to actually discover first and second generation stars in globular clusters. Um, measuring a delta U minus R from the red giant branch, you can sort stars into first and second generation candidates based on their UV photometry. And you can produce a new correlation between first generation and total generation, uh, total stars in globular clusters, these so-called first generation stars uh, versus the total uh, uh, absolute V magnitude of the globular cluster. Uh, we see a tighter correlation because we use all of the stars in the globular cluster, not just those in the core, like the HST based studies use. And this is um, a paper that is uh, uh, being circulated now amongst our collaboration. So our conclusion is that we have a, a calibrated DREDI data set. Um, it can be matched. It's a pathfinder for the Rubin Observatory and LSST. We even scratching the surface of this data set has produced some significant findings. We've ruled out the young populations claimed in Saha et al. And we've also um, confirmed that a number of uh, alleged globular clusters are, are not real. And we've demonstrated that this will be a very powerful data set for investigating all the globular clusters in the field of view. Now, the way that we're really going to realize the full capabilities of this data set will be to match our data to the Gaia uh, satellite uh, and to uh, study the kinematics of the data as a function of metallicity. But so far, we've been able to make great strides. We have a calibration between U minus I, the D red and U minus I color, and metallicity. We've used uh, catalogs of high resolution spectra provided by Zakali et al. Um, to make this correlation and therefore now can derive metallicities for 2.7 million red clump giants. Even without Gaia kinematics, we're able to see that the abundance structure of the bulge changes dramatically with increasing metallicity. The most metal rich stars are concentrated toward the plane of the Milky Way and their abundance distribution follows the simple model of chemical evolution. But at high latitudes, we see a new abundance distribution. Was this abundance distribution the result of a galactic wind? We know that there must have been a rapid and violent formation history for the um, galactic bulge slash disk early on in the history of the Milky Way. And that formation event could be expected to have produced a very dramatic uh, outflowing stellar wind um, that might have resulted in a different abundance distribution for the outer bulge. Um, this is 
a, a concept that will have to be tested with very kinematic, very uh, detailed kinematics, spectroscopic studies, and so forth, and will be a very uh, good um, uh, project for these large new um, spectroscopic surveys. The other project that we are hoping to do is uh, since we uh, uh, have uh, uh, dia distance constraints, we can largely rule out as bulge members stars that are too close to the sun to lie in the bulge. And this will, with careful photometry, a right, careful investigation, enable us to put actual limits on the young population in the bulge, but to do so over this entire 200 square degree field of regard. And with that, I want to thank you very much for your attention. And I'd love to answer any questions. Thank you very much, Michael, for this very interesting talk. And uh, now the talk is open for questions. Please, uh, for all participants, raise your hand. If you don't know how to do that, press the button participants in the, in the, menu, bo in the menu bar the bottom of your screen and it will open a, a participant list and at the bottom of that window you you can see uh, the button to raise your hand. Reiner will manage the questions. He will. So first of all I would like to say wonderful talk Mike thank you very much. I remember reading that paper time is always limited for reading paper but this one I really enjoyed. Uh, learning a lot. It's, it's quite interesting also that uh, suddenly globular clusters that were supposed to exist don't exist, etc. So very illuminating. So we have our first question. Oh no, just a comment from Javi Roman. Very nice talk, Mike. Congratulations. Thank you. While everyone is uh, thinking uh, I have a question from the very beginning. It's always intriguing this thing about the microlensed young stars. So, so what what kind of what masses are these stars supposed to have? Are they solar mass stars? Are they extremely low mass stars? These would be stars above one solar mass. Oh. Uh, when you're talking about stars, you know the nominally derived ages from uh, log g, log t effect, t effective and FE over H imply ages as young as one to two billion years. And these would be, these would stand out very clearly uh, as a distinct population if they were present in the galactic bulge. So there's a real tension. Now, these are spectroscopically derived. Okay? So you have a self-consistent solution um, with the spectrum. Uh, and you get what's called a spectroscopic parallax. Uh, and um, so none of these have actually been confirmed with photometry because the bulge dwarfs are normally very faint and then they're micro lens to be very bright while the spectrum is obtained. Still, it's a real tension. Uh, if they were uh, present in the bulge, um, we would expect to see you know, in Gaia stars at the distance of the bulge, but falling on very young isochrones of the color magnitude diagram and in large numbers. That's and we're really investigating that problem. This is one of the things we're doing in the next year. Great. Well, it's very, very intriguing. Isabel Marquez has a question. Isa. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I would first like to congratulate for the talk, Mike, and, and to thank you. So uh, I, I have the same opinion that, uh, as, as Ryan. It's have been great. And I'm sorry, I didn't put the microphone. Oh, yes, okay. That's I, that's I, better. I, I, I always forget. Trouble, okay, uh, so I wanted to congratulate you for the talk. It was uh, really very nice, and to thank you uh, for 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 given it but i have a question i'm not an expert on our own galaxy i'm working on extragalactic astronomy so in galaxies far beyond our our own one so i i'd like to know where, where there is it is possible to infer something uh, uh, testable in external galaxies uh, concerning the uh, galaxy evolution from what you are extracting concerning metallicities i mean uh, from your i mean an ages for 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 your stars 
uh, for our own galaxy, whereas it, it, it's possible to make any connection with other spiral galaxies in our vicinity or beyond? I think that it will be very interesting. I, one of the problems is that the uh, that other bulge galaxies are so distant. Um, with adaptive optics, it should be possible to get some metallicity and possibly even alpha to iron constraints for stars in the, in the bulge of M31. And I think we may see much more elevated alphas and a different chemical evolution uh, in that case. Uh, also, I think we may look at galaxies like M82 as perhaps a snapshot of the early Milky Way. M82 is ejecting uh, large volumes of gas perpendicular to the plane. Uh, and, you know, I think taking seriously the implications for, the, for what we're seeing, that is that that stratification in terms of metallicity is really telling us something about how the, how the proto disk and the bulge was formed and how it evolved. Um, as we study external galaxies, we see features like abundance gradients in the old stellar populations. We also can see uh, uh, gas phase abundance gradients um, and evidence for outflows. I think this you know, gives me an appreciation. This also may have some implications for how quenching takes place. Um, and you know, at what point in the chemical evolution of a galaxy, a galaxy becomes quenched. Um, but obviously that's, a, you know, we're a long way from there. Uh, and, and is there any possibility of, of connecting gas metallicity with stars metallicity? Because in external galaxies it's much easier to get the um, gas metallicity. So if you, if you are able to infer some kind of connection, you could probably uh, try to test in external galaxies, but I don't know where that's and if it is possible or not. Well, we're able to do some gas metallicities in the center. We actually can see metallicities of some young stars, and there's also some uh, nebular abundances that are roughly twice solar uh, near the very nucleus of the Milky Way. Um, there hasn't, there is not much. Um, the ionized gas that is at the distance of the bulge and in the bulge. And so we really we have a problem there. Mm. Okay, thank you. So one of the wonderful things of not doing physical talks, but thanks to the pandemic, Zoom reaches out across boundaries and we have Matthias Schulteis with us today. Yes. Hi, Matthias. Hi, Matthias. Hi, Matthias. Hi, Hi, Matthias. Hello. I was I got just a last minute invitation, so I, I, I didn't know that. So a uh, very fantastic talk. And, uh, oh, thank you. It's so beautiful. great to see you. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and first of all, um, I agree completely that um, we have to be, um, we have to uh, drink martinis with moderation, which means uh, <laughs> uh, not too much. Uh, so I completely agree. So that's, I think, uh, it's a very nice. So I have, I have two questions. Um, the first one, I was wondering because you, I, I, it was very beautiful when you showed about these uh, global clusters, uh, which, are, which are probably, which are not global, global clusters from, from the Minitic group. Uh, uh, with this nice data set you have, um, um, do you think you can you can look for um, still um, hidden global clusters which we which, which we didn't found and also open clusters in the bulge? We did a preliminary search for clusters with blue horizontal branch stars or young stars, by because we have um, the U band, we were able to um, do a map of the blue horizontal branch. That's in paper one. I didn't show that figure uh, because we didn't really find any new clumps of blue horizontal branch stars. We did see perhaps some hints of an extension uh, of blue HB stars uh, from the Sagittarius Dwarf Royal Galaxy, but we did. We you know there certainly will be um, uh, searches for you know there are a number of methods where you search. You, you do a moving box star color magnitude diagram type search. At the moment, you know, we're, our real problem is we're terribly underfunded. We uh, really don't have any funding at all, actually. 
to do data analysis. So everything that's done is kind of on a volunteer basis at the moment. Yeah, it's an open uh, collaboration. It would be a good, a good uh, student project or something like, like yeah, this. Yeah, in do fact, if you have a student interested in looking at the data set that way, we should definitely talk. Um, yeah. We can expand the collaboration quite easily. Um, sure. And, and the second question was just also because, um, uh, as you know, I, 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 I did a lot of studies in, in intercell extinction. Um, and with, you, with this nice data set you have, uh, I think you, you, you have a, a unique possibility to study the extinction law variation in the bulge. So because you have, you're covering the full, the full uh, wavelength domain from the U-band to the I-band, so you can really probe the extinction law variation, so the anomalous extinction law in the bulge to a very nice precision probably. Are you intending to do something on this kind of topic? I, I think that's going to be something where we have to reach out to uh, another, a new collaborator to, you know, we have the potential, we've discussed the possibility of mm -hmm. using this, of forming spectral energy distributions from the U-band to the infrared. And um, Rod Ibata, has mentioned, you know, the idea of deriving both reddening and abundances for red giants, um, and claims to have a method to do so from AI. But I think that, you know, we we definitely need. This is a really powerful data set, and we should exploit it quickly to yeah, do just that. I agree fully. So yeah, that's another area where I think there's a rich possibility of collaboration. Yeah. So right. definitely good, be in good. touch. Yeah. It was it, and thanks a lot for, for the very beautiful yeah, talk. Uh, the very important point. We haven't begun. What we can say is that because the UMISI calibration is very stable, that there must not be dramatic changes. So this UMISI versus FE over H calibration is stable as a function of latitude. The scatter is not huge, so it's unlikely that there are dramatic um, variations in the reddening law that would affect what we're doing. Okay, thanks again. But there thanks probably are subtle variations and considering them would be very helpful. And give my best to Agnes, by the way. <laughs> I will. <laughs> I will. And CV. <laughs> okay. All right. Any further last question? Oh yeah, here. Maria Dolores Caballero. Yes, you can tell me only Maria. I think I cannot go with okay. Maria. <laughs> Maria. <laughs> uh, a very nice talk, by the way. Uh, I'm not in the topic of, of galaxy evolution, but I'm very intrigued because I have seen it in the news sometimes about this X shape in the, I don't know if it is only, if it appears in the galaxy, in our galaxy, in the Milky Way or in other galaxies, but it's really very intriguing. I mean, I I wanted to explore this a little bit more. I don't know if you know something about what is it related about, is it that it has been colliding to galaxies or is due to outflows or I don't know. I mean, I- Well, can't... the, the X-shaped distribution is observed in a number of galaxies where we observe an edge on bar. And in the case of the bulge, it appears uh, that the stellar X-shaped distribution is, is a feature of the strong uh, bar structure that dominates the uh, morphology of the galactic bulge. So it's not uh, a result of a collision with another galaxy. It appears to be more metal rich. And this is from uh, work of uh, Ness et al. 2013 and other studies, um, we are confirming that the X-shaped structure is more metal rich. It still hasn't, you know, the, the morphology and kinematics of the X-shaped structure is still something uh, of, of a very intensive investigation. And unfortunately, Gaia's precision for stars at a distance of eight kiloparsecs is, is not so great. So it will really be a, a heavy lift uh, to try to you know, derive the spatial distribution of the X-shaped structure because our distances for red plum stars are also not that precise. And our most precise um, standard candles are our Lyrae stars, but they arise from metal poor populations. 
But we do see a doubling of the red clump. We see other things, particularly on the minor axis, that are consistent with this. It's kind of like a, a conical structure that is simply the result of a very strong uh, galactic bar. It even shows up in the models. So it results as a, a collision of parts of the galaxy with another thing or something. No, it's, it's the models indicate that this is not due to a, an infalling stellar system. And that would be consistent also with, we don't see any indication of that in the metallicities. The stars are metal rich. Um, they, it's, it seems to be you know, a feature of the bar that dominates most of the mass in the galactic center. So it's just a, it is a dynamical, if you look at, at galaxies face on, you'll see, you know, in the case where galaxies are barred, you'll see some pretty amazing structures, rings, lenses. Um, it's worth you know, looking through images from the Hubble catalog or online. Mm. Um, th this is a vertical structure, a complex structure that results from the strong nature of the bar that ultimately probably derives to the way that when this instability formed in the massive disk and that disk buckled, then you know, we produced a phase space structure and a physical structure that uh, results in, in this X structure. Okay. It's not completely understood, but it does show up in a number of dynamical models. Okay, thank you. Sure. I'm happy to take more questions if, you know, as long as people uh, want to stay considering that I've uh, saved uh, 11 hour plane flights, but I uh, missed out on some really good food and drink. And you missed out on Granada. <laughs> <laughs> so any, any more questions? I have one, if it's possible. Yes. Oh, yeah. Almodena. This is Almodena mm -hmm. Prieto, no? From yeah. Hello. Islands. Hello. Thank you very much for your talk. Um, if I understand correctly, do you hear me? Yes, I do. Okay. Yes. If I understand correctly, um, it appears that the uh, the uh, metal-rich population increased from uh, high latitudes towards the galactic plane, if I understood. But across radial distribution seems to be constant. There is no such gradient. So the metal-rich population remains the same with radius. Um, are you finding this? Are you finding this uh, is what you expected? Because metal rich, it looks to me, I mean, they have been a lot of reprocessing there to get to this metal rich stage. So uh, is something that should be expected to have such a constant in bulge, everything with the same metal rich around? Well, no, I'm not a dynamic. Consider what happened also in the center as well. I'm not a, not a, a dynamicist, but what I could mention is that the bar is supported by orbits, the shape of the bar is supported by orbits that migrate along the major axis of the bar. Uh, and um, given that there is considerable mixing uh, in the plane of the bar and orbits that uh, go along the major axis of the bar and mix that way, uh, it, it, it doesn't surprise me, although, you know, given I wasn't able to mention some of the, you know, because of the limitations of time, but Gerhardt's work has suggested that the proto disk may have had a strong abundance gradient radially, but when it became dynamically unstable and developed a bar that that radial gradient then mapped into a vertical gradient. Um, and this goes back to uh, Gerhardt and uh, Valpuesta, Martinez Valpuesta, I think 2013. Um, you know, the, it's so, you know, we all I can say is that using the techniques of metal abundance that measurement that we've used we see a very strong vertical gradient. We see virtually no measurable radial gradient in the bar dominated um, fields. Okay, 
Thank you. Sure, thanks. Very good question. Um, you know, we'll obviously, one of the things we want to do is we'll be able to match these with Gaia uh, kinematics. And so we'll want to look very carefully um, and see if, if this finding is confirmed kinematically. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. So given, I think, the time zone that we are in here, we have to prepare some dinner. Is there any last question? If not, then... Uh... Okay, well, it has been a wonderful talk. Thanks, Mike, for joining us. Thank you us, very much. Uh... Uh, tonight or this morning. It would be really great to, to have you in Granada, visiting in Granada once we are over the pandemic. And yeah. I, I would love to visit, yeah. Let's keep in touch. Yeah, so definitely keep in touch. And I look forward to following also your uh, wonderful, I, uh, I'm not on the colloquium committee at UCLA, but I'll try to make a suggestion. Uh, we should hear from uh, um, members of your group too, particularly your work on the Galactic Center, which is of great interest. Uh, so, so thank you very much for the wonderful invitation. Well, thank you very much again. Thank okay. you.